do you want to do just like a normal start like we did last time? I know your sister said that it would be helpful if we like specified the book and the author. <laughs> well, if they're listening to part two, I'm assuming they've either given up or know what we're talking about. So I'll at least say Gosh, that so. this is The Fabric of Civilization, Chapter 2, uh, Thread. So that's that's the one we're talking about this time. All right, so do you just want to dive right in? Yeah, um, I guess I can start off just asking what you thought overall. This is your first time reading it. Oh, my first time through? I actually... I really liked this chapter. I won't say I had quite as like intensive an emotional experience with it as I did the last one, um, but I really did enjoy it. And I sort of like uh, one of the things that they talk about in this chapter, I guess it's mostly sort of brushed over, but it's just like causality. Like when we look back on specific, I guess I'll just, talk about it explicitly since we're already there. But uh, in the beginning part, they talk about how spinning was seen as like a task that was virtuous for young women and how um, like nowadays we would look at it as like, oh, you know, something being virtuous for ladies is all about submission or something. But if you think about it from the point of view of people back then, it was actually a form of industry that women had a really strong hold over. So I thought that was pretty refreshing and interesting of a way to look at it, because I feel like you normally get more of the first story than you do the second story. Yeah, just the impact of our current views on how we interpret history and how they would have thought about things. Like, oh, here they are painting just a virtuous woman and not like, here are two key, like, lodestones on, like, economy and... <laughs> Like, uh... I agree. Yeah, just, I guess, how economically important just weaving or, like, spinning thread or just things that are just seem like hobbies and not that important now used to be. I agree. Well, what did you think of the chapter? I know I kind of went on a tangent, so... <laughs> this was a very mathy chapter. Uh, it, was my, it really was. It was my yeah. initial, like... How many pages are just, oh, if you were to make a sale, here's how many hours you'd have to spend to just weave the, not weave, spin the thread, just spinning the thread mm -hmm. of that sale, let alone anything else you have to do to actually make it a sale. And like, yeah, there's little things like the chart. <laughs> yeah, the chart. <laughs> oh, like, what was it? Like, Bronze Age wool is 566 days for a sale? Like... Wow. Yeah. Especially, I, I don't know, but thinking about piratey or naval movies whenever it's like, oh, the sails are on fire. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Like, you know, it's like, oh no. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, as long as the ship's like not burnt, you're good. But no, no, it's <laughs> like, oh, that's a year's worth of fabric that's just gone up in flames. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, my goodness. Also, I think the other thing I really liked was in the very beginning... Just the pictures of all the different spindles? Is that, is that what it was? Yeah, spindle whirls. Oh yeah, the, the whirls. Yeah. That just how like everyone across the planet has come to a very similar design of what works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will say this chapter really focused on how similar things were across the globe, really. Um, yeah. Like, and in the first chapter, they really talked about differences. They would say, oh, this was starting up in this area. Like in China, they were working on silk manufacturing and doing it better than anywhere else in the world, really. But with this, it really did say this is something that basically women did the world over for thousands of years. And that yeah. was pretty humbling, you know? <laughs> like it didn't matter where you were living. If you were a woman, you were going to be spinning. It's just, it's crazy to think that it was so homogenous oh, yeah. across the world. <laughs> Well, and it's sort of, uh, it's sort of nice. <laughs> it's yeah. sort of comforting uh, to hear how important of a focus it was made. I guess the methodology behind like teaching children how important it was to know how to do this was maybe not something I love, but, <laughs> right. but the parents passing down this like extremely valuable skill and just being like, you need this to survive. Like that's how valuable it was to everyone that you know how to do this very specific task and do it so well that you can make clothes for your whole family. 
because otherwise you're gonna be like naked <laughs> and also i guess the commonality of cloth as tax because i think just in this chapter they brought up both in china like having a certain mm-hmm. amount of silk as tax and then i think it was aztecs where they also had like a certain amount of cotton that they had to deliver uh i think i think i have it pulled up I, it says every six months, for instance, the five towns in the con- uh, conquered province of, I have no idea how to say that, uh, paid a tax of 16,000 white cloaks bordered in patterns of red, blue, green, and yellow, along with similarly astonishing amounts of underclothes, oversized white cloaks, and women's clothing. So this is work that like generations would have had to do, like generations of spinners would have to do in order to meet the tax in time to give the clothing as tribute is what they go on to say yeah. in the chapter. And I think it just really reinforces the idea of cloth as money because that's just how valuable it was. Like it was a consistent value you could rely on. Well, and it, it kind of made me feel a little bit, a little bit bad uh, <laughs> while I was reading this chapter because I've been going through my clothes recently to try and find some to give to Goodwill. And I just sort of like, Especially looking at that chart, I was a little bit staggered <laughs> by how many clothes I had. And, like, obviously there's a lot more machines available to do some of this work. So hopefully it's not all human labor going into making these clothes. But it's still just crazy to know that a thousand years ago, I would have been the richest person in the land <laughs> with the wardrobe I have right now. Right. And now I'm having a tough time deciding what clothes I want to keep and what clothes I want to get rid of, you know? Like, what a lucky person I am. <laughs> right, and not just, like, I need to hold on to every shirt because this is a year's worth of effort and money. Oh, yeah. yeah. Eight-hour days. I'm sure they were working more, but... <laughs> I do kind of wonder how much, you know, all the narrative around fast fashion, a lot of it being you know, slave labor and that kind of thing. But I wonder how much of it is also just machine efficiency. Like, I wonder if we did not, you know, exploit people for our fashion, I wonder at what rate we could keep up with. I'm honestly not sure. Because I think a lot of times when they have people, they're in, like, the final stages of processing. So they're making sure that, like, the shirt looks like a shirt, (laughs) you know? And I'm not sure how... I'm sure a machine could do it, but I'm not sure how well it could do it on a consistent basis, you know, without a lot of human supervision. Yeah, so I guess that's the current bottleneck, is the actual sewing? Because I don't think we really have great machines for doing, like, complex 3D patterns. Maybe that's the next, like, this next line in automation is AI that can (laughs) run sewing machines. Honestly, if it would help some people out, I I guess I wouldn't mind. But I suppose there are quite a few angles to look at that from, so. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess that was a very interesting way to look at, I guess, machine make, just automation in general. Like, how they were talking about how the weavers were, like, some of the first anti-technology activists. Yeah, the, the Luddites. But thinking about the weavers how they were rich because of earlier automation that made them the bottleneck but then once their job was automated they saw that as a bad thing and i guess it makes me think about how i think in other books but maybe also this one they've talked about how like the cotton industry in america used to be really big but then it got moved to asia and like that's a mm-hmm. like a bad thing because you know there's fewer jobs and it's kind of getting rid of this history there but each step of that was it being moved to a different area we used to be the cheaper thing that we got moved to because previously it was in india or in like britain and each stage has been it either getting more efficient or faster and like it's a good thing when it helps us but it's a bad thing when it hurts us without like kind of a worldwide view on what's happening even if it's better for like a country or the planet when more clothing or more fabric is being made and so it's easier to attain these things we can have a very narrow like local view of what's happening and like i don't blame people for that like there's people losing jobs but you know it would have been nice if like the you know britain recognized oh these people are losing jobs it'll be good for the country let's actually help them move somewhere and not just, well, you'll find something else. Shrug. Yeah. Well, and 
funnily enough, um, a while back I watched a video uh, on YouTube, which, you know, citation needed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it happened to have a section that was talking about the Luddites specifically, and in contrast to our modern day sort of AI innovations with like artists and technology workers. And uh, one of the things that was brought up is, you know, people talked about the Luddites as being anti-technology when it wasn't necessarily about the technology itself. It was, like you said, the economic strain being put on them because of it. But I guess going off of that, whenever there's automation happening, it does seem to move money from the many to the fewer and that's not necessarily a great direction if you're not also setting up ways to protect the many. Well, I guess we have to decide what the end point of automation actually is. Yeah. Like, do we want to automate our life to the point where, like, there is no human labor involved or very so little that it's almost negligible so that people can just, like, live their lives without economic strain? Because if everything can be done by machines, then... I guess we can just be people. Like, we can just live our lives, you know? Like, yeah. is that the end goal of automation? Or is it we want to make as few people as possible and make a lot of money as possible because there's only so many jobs and those are extremely important or the world falls apart, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, it, we have to pick and choose what we want out of this technology. And that's a lot harder to do once it's already implemented and people are seeing benefits from it, financial or otherwise. So I, I don't know, I have a lot of empathy for sort of the Luddite movement. I can kind of see where they were coming from, uh, even though they certainly get a bad rap. <laughs> I remember I was listening to one of the podcasts that I think CGP Grey and Brady did, Hello Internet, mm -hmm. and one of their things is talking about automation and how People always say about automation is, oh, it's a good thing because it'll just make more better jobs. Like, that's a guaranteed thing. That's, it's not really, like, up until this point, it has been. We've been getting more mm -hmm. better, I guess, better, by what definition, I don't know. But more jobs that people are <laughs> filling. But, like, there's no guarantee that's going to always be the case. And if, we, if we're going to be as a society against the idea of, like, a universal basic income or, like, I guess a certain amount of if there isn't a job for you, you're still taken care of, then, like, what do we, yeah, what do we want to happen? Like, if everything's automated away, like, what do you actually want people to be doing? And do you care if they're not, like, doing, I don't want to say doing anything, because people like doing stuff, but I guess having a job. Yeah, well, if they're not spending money, because as it stands now, in order for the world to function, people need to have their needs met, and the way we do that is through the exchange of, like, money for goods and services. So I, I don't think we're quite to the point where this is an immediate issue, but I do think it's worth talking about, like, where, <laughs> what's our end goal here? So... <laughs> We've come a long way from fabric, but... <laughs> we really have. <laughs> well, I, they did talk about how Italy was a center for silk spinning, which I did not expect. That was very surprising information to me. Every time we read anything in this book about, oh, this is a major area for this kind of textile thing, yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> I've... Like, how it's like, oh, Japan and America were focusing on cotton in the last chapter. I'm like, how have I never heard of this? <laughs> how did I not know that Italy or something was a major center? I don't know any of this. Well, and... I don't know anything about the history of cloth, and I've already read this book. I guess, in retrospect, it made sense. Like, when they were talking about, oh, you know, like, Venice. Places like that were areas where this was the case. I was like, those are extremely wealthy areas. And they have, like, Venetian glass. Like, I don't know. Just for some reason, once that piece of the puzzle came together, it made so much sense to me <laughs> why some of these areas have been so prosperous for so long, even though I didn't necessarily know explicitly that's why it happened or is part of why it happened. I don't know. It just, it made sense. But I never would have guessed it, you know? <laughs> where 
was it in the last chapter that they said really took off with like silkworm? I it was also Italy. Rearing? Let me see. Is that, I wonder which one happened first, because they said that there was an abundant supply of material, but not the fabric, so I wonder if that happened directly after they were able to start rearing silkworms. I don't know. Yeah. I need a timeline of silk production. <laughs> I also want to know why India was so much better Me at too. spinning cotton. That, that surprised me as well. I mean, I wonder if maybe it was just a population thing, like there were more people there, but I don't know if that's... Yeah, did they just yeah, have, like, is techniques? Technical? Is it just, like, per capita? Do you hear my cat? She's just walking up to me meowing. What are you doing? Anyways. <laughs> but you're talking. Um. That's reason enough. <laughs> um, I'm in this section where it's talking about Agostino Bassi, who was the one who tried to prevent silkworm death from like silkworm breeders. He is uh, about 20 miles south of Milan, so Italy. Um, okay. I wanna know which one happened first. Uh, it said, in late 1807, 34-year-old Bossi embarked on what turned out to be 30 years of experiments aimed at identifying and countering the cause of a disease variously known as, oh goodness, maldesegno? Muscardine, or in a nod to the white powder covering cat the caterpillars it killed, Calco, Calcino, or Calcinicio. <laughs> uh, so I think that would be later than the time frame they were talking about, because they were talking about 1807, and I think they were talking about... Well, it's Deering, because I think this said that... So the... The silk throwing machine that discussed here was uh, open in 1678, and then it went until 1930. So it looks like they started. That's why they had the the silk production at all. And then I guess at some point they got better silk thread production. Yeah, it doesn't explicitly say where they sourced it from, which is I don't know. I don't know whether he figured all this out in Italy, though. That's what I'm trying to remember, because I thought maybe he traveled somewhere, but perhaps not. Well, it's also Japan, right? So it was Japan for rearing silkworms and China for how to spin it. And that reminds me, I thought it was super neat that the first advancement in spinning was in an area that didn't need it as much because they had because they had different techniques with the longer fibers. That is what enabled them to discover how to handle the shorter fibers better. I agree. And I just think that's really interesting that like ideas come from looking at different things. Yeah, it's just straight ingenuity. Like, why not? <laughs> I do like that certain sense of like, there's got to be a better way. Like, it's so much better to do the long threads like this. There's got to be a better way to do the short threads. Yeah, there's got to be a use for it too. Because I think that's what the book pointed to was it was just so ubiquitous like it, they had to use it, it it's so valuable there's got to be a better way like you said <laughs> yeah and i'm glad reading this chapter again made me think of like i really want to know how spinning machines work because every time we talk about them i have no idea how to visualize that and so i finally looked up a video i'm like okay i kind of get the idea of how the spinning works like you pre-spin it around a stick and then when it comes off it comes off with that coil because I didn't understand, like... How they kept it so even? I don't know what I was imagining, but I I, I was imagining, like, an extruder just... You know in um, <laughs> Meet the Robinsons? Uh-huh. How they, have you, how they have the peanut butter and jelly machine? Yes. That, like, spins <laughs> to put yeah. out the peanut butter and jelly? Like, that's what I was imagining. <laughs> but I, I didn't really know. know how that would work. <laughs> I mean, so I, I see there. why you got there. I guess... My only frame of reference was Sleeping Beauty, because she pricks her finger on a spinning wheel. I still don't know how spinning wheels work. I don't either, but they must have been part of it. Like, I kind of have the idea of a Jenny now, but I need to look up a video for spinning well, wheels. Well, it seems like... There's an Instagram person I follow who spins a lot, and I'm just like, I don't understand what you're doing. <laughs> That's what I was going to say, though. It seems like a lot of people do it just as a hobby. It seems like there really is quite the market just to 
not make your own genes or anything, but you know, whirl your own fibers into beautiful, beautiful. It's hard though, because the that Instagram person I follow, like, she said that I should not knit with hand spun through like yarn anymore because it's really hard. So she has this hand spun yarn, she knits with it, and it will fall apart because it's not like tight enough or consistent enough. So she has these hours put into knitting the object only for the spinning to kind of be the downfall of the the garment. And so it really puts into perspective like how hard spinning must be that she does it that much and she and she still thinks that I can't I can't rely on this for complicated projects. Yeah, I mean I guess it just <laughs> reinforces why those parents were so extremely worried about getting their kids not only to be able to do it but to do it well or else you will freeze to death. <laughs> Yeah. Or you won't be able to sail your ship or... <laughs> or waste all the hours you spent knitting an item, because that's intense. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I would just give up, honestly. <laughs> like, of course, if it were a matter of life and death. Yeah, I think I'd just be like, mm, I'm done. I, I can barely handle getting through this blanket I'm trying to make right now. <laughs> Let alone the, like, oh, important, I need this urgently type of project that just falls apart. That would destroy me for a while, I think. I wonder how prevalent repetitive strain injuries were. Well, I'm sure they were around, but I mean, honestly, who knows if they could identify it as anything other than like arthritis or (laughs) if you lived long enough to really feel it set into your bones, you know? If you're spinning nonstop, like, does that, because I know when when I'm knitting, just a good few hours and my hands start feeling a bit like, mm, I need to do something else. Or was there like a varied enough task where you're only we- like spinning in between tasks that it mixes it up? I don't know. The way that I understood like what the, what I think the chapter was trying to say was in between domestic tasks, you would be doing this. So like you're always kind of spinning, but you're not just only ever spinning. It seems like it was like, oh, you are making dinner? you're spinning. (laughs) You're taking care of a child, you're spinning. (laughs) Those spinning meetups where like just all the women in the area would all meet together and just like chat and spin. I'm like, oh, I want that. That sounds Mm -hmm. so nice. (laughs) Yeah, like the spinning bees or whatever. And like you can kind of do that now because that's kind of what I do with those meetups. Uh, like the knitting and sewing ones, but I feel like it's different if it's like everyone in your area who you know. It's very like your family, your friends, people you grew up with, just everyone together. Just spinning. It's it's hard to find that sort of like, I guess, collective activity because people really, like we do a lot of similar tasks, but the tasks are designed such that they are to be done on your own, in your own home. Like, we don't all get together and do dishes in the river or something. We do them in our sinks (laughs) or in the dishwasher, I guess, you know, Um, if you're lucky. But (laughs) I would totally be down for communal, like, cooking and dishes and just meet up with, like, your neighbors. That sounds so much better than cooking by yourself. Ah, I don't know. Sometimes I think I would be, like, gung-ho about it, and then some days I think I would just be like, I don't want to interact with another person, so. That's why it's got to be someone you're, like, comfortable with, like, because, like, it's already so much easier whenever Nathan and I are cooking, and I'm like, okay, you do these things, I'll do these things, and I don't have to worry about, like, half as much of the stuff, because there's so many, like, if you're making a good meal, a lot of times there's a lot of different things to think about. It's nice to share that, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. Have another set of eyes, so if your pot is about to boil over, someone can be like, hey, your pot is about to boil over, or don't forget the oregano, or something, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Um, what were we talking about? It looks like she stopped. I guess we were, we were basically just talking about how difficult it is to talk about this particular chapter, because so much of it is... Numbers, (laughs) <laughs> numbers, <laughs> which is fascinating when you're reading them, but it's maybe a little less fascinating just discussing them after the initial shock value of like, it takes this long to make this, you know. I guess for the future, at the very end of the chapter, they did point to uh, the factory in Georgia that is still 
like producing textiles, but now they're almost like a niche industry. The way that they do it, I guess, is pretty, pretty out there. I, uh... Yeah, like if you can't be the cheapest, you have to be the best. Yeah. And that's what they're going for, is they're trying to be, I guess, the luxury brand. I don't know how else to say it. Is It seems like they're trying to be that, like, extremely high-level, high-quality cotton. Which is interesting, because it was still from, like, wasn't it from still Target or something? Like, it wasn't... Oh, yes, like, that's one of the places they sell to. Yeah, so it's not, like, top... Top-tier atelier, haute couture stuff. Yeah, it's not top tier. It's still cheap clothes, but it's like the nicer cheap clothes because you can't compete with the lowest of the low. I'd like to see the different margins of cost here because it was still... I, did they give a price? Because I don't... If they did, it was not much. And if it's a Target shirt, it probably wasn't that expensive. I'm not sure, but either way, like the margins of cost that they're operating at are so slim that this is a tiny niche company being sold at Target. No. Which is not an expensive brand. Well, and uh, one of the other things they mentioned is they have about 120 workers spread out over four different shifts and that when what the author noted as she was walking through the space was (laughs) you didn't really run into people. It was just machine after machine after machine and then you'd see somebody driving a forklift or, you know, somebody popping up just to check in on a machine. It's really very hands-off at this point producing the actual cotton itself. I wonder how long until it's machines fixing the machines and there's just no people there. (laughs) I mean, I suppose that'd help with their margins, so, which is what they're worried about, yeah. But uh, they did give uh, sort of numbers at the, uh, the author did give numbers at the end to kind of wrap it up. They're producing, I think, something close to like 9 million pounds of, of the cotton, I think, a year. Which is crazy that that's a small operation. How much clothing is being made? Yeah, because it, oh, they said it's like something to about 18 million women's t-shirts. It's, it's a lot of clothing being made. And if you look at the earlier chart and you try and think about <laughs> the amount of hours that would have to have been for any one of these people in any of these time frames, I mean, that's staggering. Uh, I think she, yeah, she goes on to say that it was enough to keep uh, people spinning for something like three centuries, what they produce in a year. It's crazy to think just how flipped it is from what it used to be. Like, cloth was the most valuable thing, basically. Mm -hmm. And now we're just throwing it away by the billions of pounds every year. Exactly. And that's just such a... It it changed so quickly. I mean, I'm sure living through it, it didn't feel like it did. Uh, Especially because a lot of the things we're talking about happening did happen over the course of centuries. But... It does, when you're looking back on it from our perspective and you're like, oh, here was the quality of life for someone in like 1200 and here it is for someone in, I don't know, the 1800s, they're night and day. Like, (laughs) it's a completely different level of human existence that I don't know that like a peasant from the 1200s could have even fathomed (laughs) because it's just... But even... it, It wasn't even that long ago, though, because, what, it was the 1930s for whenever... It was just when the silk wasn't manufactured as much in Italy. So when was it actually, like, when clothes became so cheap? Like, when did that actually take place? I mean, I think clothes were still extremely expensive because, uh, as we talked about before, the labor put into sewing them hasn't been fully automated yet. So I wonder if it was less about the cloth and more about the actual forming of the clothes, you know, like making them and shaping them at that point. Like, the labor that would have to go into making a woman's dress is different now than it was even, you know, (laughs) probably even, like, 60 years ago. (laughs) Maybe, maybe further back. A hundred. Let's go with a (laughs) hundred. I guess, uh, if you have more insights or things you want to talk about... I think I should have a small comment about for the next chapter. Oh, okay. Because of our discussion of 
of when the bottleneck happened. And I guess when it changed, I'm curious if we'll see more of that in, was is it cloth or fabric? Cloth in the cloth chapter? I'm, I'd be interested to see how that goes in there. So I, I'm peeking ahead, trying to look at like what's coming up. And it looks like it's more so about weaving from what I can tell. So, mm, yeah. Maybe in, I wonder if it'll be in consumers? Because we have, after cloth, we've got dye, traders, consumers, innovators. Um, Where's the chapter on sewing? I mean, I'm sure it's sprinkled around. Because even, even in the earliest chapter, there was sort of, you know, like, the fact that this is going to make clothing kind of hung over what we were talking about, you know? Like, one of the big things you're trying to do when you're making, you know, fibers work together is make clothes. I mean, obviously tools, things like that, but clothes. Clothes is a big one. Yeah, is there anything that you're hoping this book will discuss? I know you talked about uh, women's work and stuff like that, and they sort of danced around it, so... Was there anything you were hoping to learn from this book in particular? I guess not really learn, but I do want the perspective of just how good we have it now. You know, that it's not a massive thing if something bad happens to our clothes. Like, we can get it mended, sure, but if it's, like, got ruined, that's fine. Like, that one time I hopped a fence and somehow tore my ent- the entire leg of my jean. Sure, it's unfortunate, but I can get new <laughs> jeans. Yeah, it doesn't ruin your life. <laughs> you aren't going to be freezing in the cold winter snow because your one pair of jeans that you had for the next four years is fine or is broken. <laughs> yeah. Sure, it's sad and your favorite pair of jeans gets torn, but it's more of an emotional thing, not like a physical risk. I mean, yeah, we do go to stores and we buy like a cheap shirt and we're like, okay, this is the shirt I'm going to paint in or move in because I anticipate it getting ruined and I'm okay with that. Like it's, yeah, it, it was quite the experience sitting there and like packing up certain clothes to go to Goodwill or, you know, whatever I'm going to end up doing with them. We'll see if they actually make it there. But I was just like, my goodness, I wonder. So like my great grandfather is still alive and he was around for the depression uh, he had to, like, drop out of school so he could work and help take care of his family and stuff like that. And I just wonder, even further back beyond it, if our ancestors could see, like, how well we're living today, would they feel happy for us? Like, would they, or would they be ashamed? I don't know. <laughs> I can't tell. I bet it'd be a pretty fair mix between the people who are like, yes, that's why we work hard, so our kids can have better lives, and the people who are, I walked both ways uphill. In the snow. In the snow. Ten miles. <laughs> and clearly you guys are all just weak. Yeah, that's fair. I guess, yeah. I bet it'd just be a pretty good mix. The same way it's been for every generation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to focus on the people who are like, yes, this is a good thing. I'm glad you're living well. I'm, I'm going to try not to feel guilty over, over ghosts who disapprove of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Have we covered everything? I just, I don't want to forget something. I think so. I think okay. we did. I think we covered enough for however long this recording will be by That's the end fair. of the editing. Well, I suppose we didn't talk too much about inventions themselves. Like, we didn't explicitly talk about the Jenny or anything and how that came about. I don't remember anything about about them, to be honest. Yeah, that kind of, like, left my brain. We didn't talk about the espionage (laughs) in Italy that was brought back to Britain. I do love that. (laughs) That guy was just like, hey, I'm going to go steal all this important technology. And then Britain was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. That seems to be a trend, though. Because that was with the uh, the silkworms, too. It wasn't quite espionage, but definitely let's go over there, figure out what they're doing, and then we'll do it. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's how information gets passed around, but it is one of those things yeah. where you're like, hmm, okay. Oh, that does make me think of the, num- the one thing I'm like, yes, Britain, that was the thing to do. Mm-hmm. Whenever they paid the guy to uh, not um, renew his patent and also yeah. provide a working demonstration, like, yes, we need that for way more things. Oh, we totally it's do. It's so much better for society when a new groundbreaking invention is available for m- multiple people to work with than if just one person takes control of it. 
Well, I was looking into it because there was this, uh, there was some research that I found really interesting and I was going to try and like maybe make this setup for myself at home. And I found out that if it's not explicitly for research purposes, even if it's just for personal use, if you like build something that someone else has patented through the process of like writing papers about it or something, even though they're releasing those papers to the public, you can still get sued. <laughs> like you're still technically wow. in violation of patent law. And because I'm not like an institute doing research, I was too scared. <laughs> I was like, if someone sues me, I'll die. <laughs> I don't have money. <laughs> anyway, that was that was a tangent, but I agree. All that to say, I agree, it would be better if more people were able to work with new technology sooner because I think the more hands you can get onto something, the more new and interesting ways it can develop. And that seems to mainly serve us, so. <laughs> yeah, like didn't the guy who invented insulin explicitly not, not patent, patent it, it so that oh, people yeah. could use it? It didn't necessarily turn out the way he wanted, but. No. You could definitely tell an inventor's like trying to improve humanity versus make a shit ton of money. Yeah, because he could have been like wealthy eight times over. Like what he did saved lives and he knew it because <laughs> that's a valuable thing. So like you said, he was just like, no, not going to do that. Not going to patent it. And I think yeah. the companies found a way around that, right? Is that... I don't know how, but yes. Okay. Yeah. Bummer. Well, but I think... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Bummer note to go out on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'll call that good. Yes. <laughs>